there are essentially two models of decision making and behavior. So if you imagine that system one is your fast thinking and effortless system, what that really means is the bits of your brain that control your behavior when you're doing something that is routine or automatic. System two, to contrast, is your slow thinking and deliberate system. Now the reason this is an interesting and useful distinction is because very often when we're trying to do social policy interventions, trying to get people to do something differently, we rely upon changing their system two. Their motivation, their thought processes, trying to make something, them kind of actively commit to do something. However, what we know is actually there's a load of untapped stuff in system one, and system one's actually responsible for a much greater proportion of our routine behaviors than you might imagine. So I've got three principles for you today, and this is the first one. Um, and I think it's a super important one when you think about the different things that we might uh, do to change behavior, is first to understand that we do not know our own behavior. This is true of everybody. And um, if I asked everybody in this room to put their hand up and tell me the exact number of minutes they exercise on an average week, no one will be able to answer that question accurately. People overestimate or they just remember the one day where they did a bit more exercise or you know, even that they uh, have convinced themselves that they do more than they actually do. If you, this is a really excellent study. If you had an unhealthy meal, if you show somebody a Big Mac meal and say how many calories are in it, and you show somebody else a Big Mac meal with a side salad and ask them how many calories are in that, people guess lower when you add a side salad. So obviously unless a salad has negative calories, which of course it does not, that is not possible. Second, contextual cues make a big difference. So what that means is somebody who's typically a healthy person, if you put them in a different context, may behave in a way that is very unhealthy, and vice versa. Everyone knows if you put something at the end of an aisle in a supermarket, people will buy more of them than if you put it in the middle of an aisle. So for beer, people buy 23% more if you put it at the end of the aisle. For wine, 34%. And in fact, carbonated drinks are one of the highest. So sweet drinks, right at the end of the aisle, you get 52% more purchases. And the reason that's relevant to us is because what it shows is things like carbonated drinks are a bit of an impulse purchase. Just another small thing about contextual information, this is a study that we actually did, is there are ways you can use this to your advantage. One of the great things about this is very often we express the uh, unhealthiness perhaps of something like a soft drink in terms of calories. That's not actually necessarily that easy a unit for people to juggle. If you're gonna drink a juice, you have to walk for 37 minutes just to burn off that one drink that you could drink in 30 seconds. So you do have to do a lot of exercise with calories. It's kind of flipping it out. Has anyone ever run on a treadmill that tells you how many calories you've burned? You run for like 30 minutes and you look down, it's one of the most crushing and disappointing things in the world. When you look down at it, it's like, you've burned 18 calories. <laughs> Been here for half an hour. Um, and um, given that that, is, that ratio of exercise to calories burnt is so unforgiving, why not flip it around and use it to your advantage? So we didn't completely change the world, but at least we encouraged some people to choose something more healthy. Now the third, now we often talk about good intentions. Evidence shows that lunch brought from home is much more unhealthy than lunch at school. Um, it might often be things like sandwiches or something like that that seems healthy, but the sizes of the lunches are normally much bigger than what the school would give you. In this particular area in the UK, they implemented a pre-ordering system. So instead of saying to the kid when they arrive at the cafeteria at lunchtime, what would you like to eat? They and their parents, at the beginning of each week, have to get a little form and they tick exactly which foods they want to eat. And they cannot change their mind when they show up. So you say, okay, you've used your long-term self, your system too, when you're thinking about what you want, when you're not necessarily hungry right now, to decide what you want, and then you lock them in such that when they get there, they cannot change their mind. Just here are the results. The percentage of students who choose a healthy lunch doubles when you pre-order, doubles. There are so many possible options around you at all times. The restaurants you walk past, um, things in the shops that you go to, you know, even in your workplace, there'll be maybe snacks and drinks that you can have. There are so many moments where you can choose to eat or drink more. And the problem is, you know, if you can consider our ancestors who, you know, maybe they were doing something like farming, they did not have that problem. Whereas for a modern person, there are a huge number of organizations that make a profit from you buying their food. It might not even be unhealthy food, it might just be more food. And um, they bombard you constantly with information and with choices. 
And it's not just easy to blame corporations, right? Not just them, it might even be our own cells. We leave food out in our homes, in our offices. And as a result, you're constantly having to face temptation. And if we know that we're not very good at fighting temptation, one of the things about this final point is find a way to eliminate it rather than find a way to resist it.